Our next unit on this topic is called agnostic learning. We're still talking about computational learning theory. This will be the third of the four big pieces uh, in learning theory. The first one being the definition of fact learning. The second one was the, um, the sort of learnability in the consistent learning model where we just have a bound on the sample complexity. The third one is agnostic learning and the fourth one will involve BC dimension. So we're talking about agnostic learning now. What we've seen is we've seen the general setting of fact learning. And in particular, we talked about this question of how good will a classifier be if the learning algorithm is guaranteed to produce a consistent classifier? How good will a classifier be? That is, how good will a classifier that's consistent with the training set be in the future? The problem is this consistency. Why should a classifier be consistent with the training data? What if the classifier makes 1% error on the training data? Is that okay? Maybe it will do better in the future. Who knows? Uh, let's maybe, rather than talking about it in an informal way, let's list out all the assumptions that we have. The first assumption that pervades across this uh, unit on fact learning is this uh, assumption that the training examples and future examples are drawn IID from the same distribution. Well, IID is from the same distribution. They are drawn independently from the same distribution. The second assumption that we made just for now is that the hypothesis space is finite. That's what allowed us to count the number of functions because you have a finite number of functions. The third assumption is for any concept that the, the that uh, nature might have chosen from this hypothesis space, there is always a function in the hypothesis space that is consistent with it. I think I said that a uh, little less correctly than I would have liked. For any concept that nature might have chosen from the concept class, there's always a function from the hypothesis class that's consistent with it. So I can always find a classifier that is consistent with any training data. So what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to drop this last assumption because maybe we can't find uh, a classifier that's consistent with uh, a training data searching only the class of functions that we are searching. So this, this takes us into this regime called agnostic learning. So this is an example uh, of a picture where the concept class is inside the red circle. Um, sorry, the concept class is the red circle and the true function is this red dot inside it. And the hypothesis class is maybe a larger set that contains that function. And if we set that, if we search that larger search set uh, and our learning algorithm is, uh, uh, our search algorithm is good, we are guaranteed to find the thing. This is, I claim, not a reasonable assumption because this requires us to know what the true, the, what the concept class is. How do I know what class of functions uh, nature uses to decide of whether a photograph contains a cat or not? There's no way, I, I, I have no way of even getting, you know, uh, start getting started answering that question. So the only reasonable setting, I would argue, is we're trying to learn a concept using some hypothesis class, and the true concept may or may not be inside that set. So the true concept here is in, not inside the set H, uh, but we don't know. In fact, the, the, a more uh, appropriate way of saying this is we have no idea what the concept class is. The true concept may be inside the set of functions we are searching. Maybe it's not, and we have no clue. So this setting is called agnostic learning. The learner is agnostic to the true concept class. And the question that, uh, the technical question that comes up is, can we say something about sample complexity inside this setting? Questions about the setting before we start proving things. Do we even the question? One of the question is: Do we know what the hypothesis space is? We have to know what the hypothesis space is because our learning algorithm has to explore it. Anytime you pick a learning algorithm and you run it, you have committed to a certain hypothesis space. Like if you run perceptron, you're using linear classifiers, L linear classifiers on the features. If you use uh, 
decision sums of size no more than five, that is a set of functions. If you're searching over three CNF, then it's a set of functions. Your learning algorithm needs to know what the search space is before it commences. So we do know the hypothesis space. Yeah, so the, at this point, the learn, we have to kind of make our learning, the, the goals of learning a little bit more realistic. Importantly, we are no longer guaranteed a zero training error because the true function may not be inside our concept class. So maybe we will, there are certain training examples that not no function in our set can even reasonably predict correctly. So there may be no classifier that is uh, consistent with attaining any training set. In other words, uh, the best thing we can hope for is to find a classifier that has low training error. Remember, the training error is simply the number of uh, mistakes that the, the, the hypothesis makes the training error of a hypothesis H is the number of mistakes it makes uh, on the training set divided by the number of training examples. So it's the fraction of training examples that it got wrong. So we can, of course, enumerate, I say, of course, but of course it's not necessarily an easy thing. Conceptually, we could enumerate every possible classifier that exists in our hypothesis class and find the one that has the lowest training error. The question that we are interested in, though, is we don't care about low training error. We want to improve. We want to make a statement about generalization error, about future error. What we want is a guarantee that a classifier that has low training error will have good accuracy on future examples. Accuracy on future examples or error on the error on future example is the probability that on a randomly drawn example, the hypothesis that we chose disagrees with the true function f. What we can optimize is this quantity, but what we care to optimize is this quantity. Questions? Yes. We don't even know what C is. We have no idea what C is, so we can't really tell whether there's an intersection or not. So theoretically, it would just be an approximate. We want to read, we want to make the tentativeness a little bit more concrete here. How bad can it be? Other questions? Yes. Uh, I find it there seems to be some conflict between the training error and the generalization error. I don't know whether it's a side equation, for example, if you see it, and just flow the three, and you get a one percent training error. Mm -hmm. But if you know your response, then we definitely know the general error is possible to that. Right. That's right. So the, the, that, that's a good comment. The comment is it's not enough to just find the lowest training error because maybe there's noise in the data and your learner is going to overfit the noise. So just because I found a classifier that has low training error does not mean that that classifier is going to generalize well. That's a, that's a very good observation. What we are going to do now is not really say that low training error implies low generalization error. Instead, we'll say the generalization error for any classifier can be no more than its training error plus some other quantity. It's going to be more than the training error. How much worse can it be? And we are going to try to bound it. And it turns out that the mathematical tools for you know, create, uh, constructing these kinds of uh, bounds are somewhat different from the ones that we have encountered so far. In particular, they involve, the, we will use uh, what are called tail bounds for the analysis, which is really a question about how far can any random variable get from its uh, uh, mean. So if I if I have a random, this is like a bunch of this. This is a cartoon picture. Don't give too much credence to this. But uh, the tail of a distribution is really the uh, how far it gets away from the mean, and you want to make sure that there's not too much probability mass allocated 
far away from the mean. Uh, this is to really loose, but you've probably seen uh, a bunch of uh, theorems in, I don't know, fixed grade or something, or when you encounter probabilities on, you know, how how much, how far certain random variable can be from its mean. So let's maybe just recollect those things. Um, I say fixed grade, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe second, who knows? Uh, kids these days are always smarter than uh, kids my age. Um, the first sort of interesting point to note is the law of large numbers. Uh, the law of large numbers is uh, simply that uh, they're simply saying that if you collect more samples, the empirical average converges to the two expectations. So let's say you have a coin. I don't know its bias. I want to know what the probability of uh, n is. I toss a coin a bunch of times. M times and uh, count the number of times I see head. And I just take the ratio and I ask the number of tosses increases. The, this ratio, the track can will get closer and closer to the true probability. In the limit, this will be the true probability and that's uh, the law of large numbers. As the number of trials increases, we get better estimates of the probability. But it's not enough to say that as the number of trials increases, it's enough to get law, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get closer to probability. We would like to know how how fast this gap converges. How many trials do you need to guarantee that uh, you'll get within some epsilon of the true probability? That's the kind of statement we want to make. Another kind of another bound that we want to uh, that you may have seen before uh, are these Markov inequality and Chebyshev's inequality. Markov simply says what's the probability that a certain non-negative random variable exceeds some constant probability that x is more than a is going to be less than the expected value of x divided by a. That's Markov's inequality. Chebyshev is simply saying what's the probability that x minus the mean, the absolute value of that, meaning how far is it from the mean, is more than k standard deviations, is going to be less than 1 over k squared. I'm pulling this up mostly to kind of trigger this frame of mind. We're not going to use either one of these in what comes next, but this is the kind of uh, analysis that we'll be doing next. What we would like to do is not to bound uh, a particular random variable, but to bound the sum of random variables. The specific random variable of interest that we have is what's the probability that this particular classifier will make an error on a future example? That's the error, right? That's the, uh, that's the generalization error. I'm going to approximate that using a mean and then try to put a bound on it. This is like a high level agenda for the next maybe 15 minutes. Um, a, none of this is going to get used directly, but uh, just want to kind of put you in the right frame of mind. Let's go back to um, the, let's actually go to the actual inequality that we will use. This is called Huffington inequality. It is, how fast can a sum of a set of random variables, or, uh, or rather, how much can a sum of a set of random variables differ from its expected value? This could probably, rather than sum, I could say average. So what we have here is, let's say that I have some, uh, 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 like uh, uh, some random variable whose true probability is p. Like imagine that there's a coin toss, and the probability of seeing heads is p. And I'm going to estimate that probability by conducting m independent trials. I'm going to toss the coin m times. I can calculate the probability of heads using, you know, this the p bar is simply number of heads divided by m. Hefting's inequality says, uh, it asks, what's the probability that the true probability that I have p is more than p bar plus some epsilon is it, the, the p bar is epsilon more away fr uh, from the true probability and what it says is this quantity is going to be less than e power 2m epsilon squared don't worry about proving it for now just take it as a given this is just something that exists it simply says that as the number of trials increases p bar and p are going to approach each other really really fast because this quantity e power minus 2m epsilon square, importantly, is there is a e power minus m there. So as m increases, this drops really fast. So as the number of trials, the number of coin tosses increases, 
your empirical probability p bar plus uh, or rather the, the true probability p will be uh, the probability that it's let's say this right we're talking about probabilities of probabilities so it just becomes after a point i say the word enough number of times that it loses meaning so let's say let's say uh, uh, let me do this correctly you toss a coin m times and if i plot m versus e power minus 2 m epsilon square let's say i fix epsilon this drops really fast it doesn't go below zero but i don't know how to draw that um, so as the number of trials increases this quantity the right hand side goes down really fast which means the left hand side is going to go down really really fast what is the left hand side the left hand side is asking what's the probability that the true uh, bias of the coin is epsilon away from the empirical bias the the, the uh, fraction that you calculate and the because the right hand side is going to go down really fast as the number of trials increases these two things p and p bar are going to get really close really fast yes and yes so let's say yeah um, does this only work for uh the s in your uh, the so this is only one side of the Hefting bond. Hefting is equal. There are two inequalities here. I'm not showing the other one. Uh, there's the other side also, which uh, we will be using this one. So there's an expression for probability of p bar greater than p plus epsilon, and that also will be that also drops exponentially with the number of. So the, the, it kind of convert tightly con uh, pushes it on both sides. The right hand side of the other one is. It's not the same, it's uh, slightly different and I always get it wrong, so I'm not going to try to write it here. These are the kinds of things that are worth looking at. I can uh, point you to the reference if you want. Yeah, I was just thinking, it's just a formalization of the model. This is about the rate of it, the rate of convergence. It's more than just saying, uh, in eventually it will converge. This is saying it converges exponentially fast. All of this, so these bonds that we saw before did not talk about the rate of convergence. It did not say how many examples do you need to see, uh, or rather this one. Uh, it does not say anything about how, how many examples you need to see to how many trials you need to conduct to actually get this uh, uh, for the uh, empirical estimate of probability to converge to the true estimate. How fast does it converge? What Hefting's inequality says is it converges really fast. The gap shrinks exponentially. Uh, questions? Other questions? I would like you to take this as a given. What we have here is simply saying that the rate of convergence is uh, really rapid as the number of trials increases. The ma mapping I'm going to do now is the true mean will be the error of the generalization error of the classifier. So this quantity here. Now, this quantity here will behave, we'll, we'll treat it like the generalization error of the classifier. This quantity here will be the training error, and M is the number of training examples, and we we'll literally just apply the Hefting's inequality and we'll get the bar. So we have seven, eight minutes, and maybe I'll just power through this, and uh, you can kind of go over it offline and come back with questions. I hate to kind of power through like loads of math. So, questions? Let's try what we can and then we revisit this. We'll start again at the beginning of the next lecture. So, let's go back to agnostic learning. So, the random variable of interest here is the generalization error of the classifier. So, this is what I call error D of some classifier x this is the quantity that we do not know but we would like to estimate somehow we'd like to see how fast is that generalization error uh going to con or rather how fast is the training error going to look like the generalization error? the training error is something that we can calculate the training error is simply the error of the classifier on the training data and because the training data is chosen iid from the same set of from the population the training error is a 
unbiased empirical estimate of the generalization error. So then I can ask what's the probability that the true error is more than epsilon away from the generalization error. That's the, that's the game that we're going to play. And we can directly apply something in equality here. So let's do that. The probability that the true error, this is the random variable that we would like to uh, uh, estimate. And the probability that that quantity is more than epsilon away from the empirical estimate is literally just a copying that uh, the bound we get. It's less than e power 2m uh, minus 2m epsilon square. Just to kind of remind you of where we are, the inside the probability expression, the left hand side is the true error. It's the probability that f of x is not equal to h of x on a, on a randomly chosen example. The right hand side consists of uh, the empirical error, which is just a fraction of the training examples that were misclassified by this particular hypothesis. Yes. Um, so that we are assuming that as a given because the if the training data is sampled by ID from the the population, then by law of large numbers, if you have infinite training examples, you will get the error. It's that's just a consequence of the law of large numbers. We are asking how fast does it get there? Okay, so other questions before we. Yes. Yeah. So that's the that's the neat trick that uh, uh, that's uh, happened here. So Huffington's inequality originally the version that we saw was the probability of p greater than p bar plus epsilon is. Let me pull a new page up because this is this is a a subtle point. So I want to kind of spend a bit of time on that, and that will take us to the end of the lecture today. The original Huffington's inequality, or not the original, one of the Huffington's inequality is probability of p greater than so that's the expression that we had before. We have not the in in what we have written here. There is oh what happened? Yeah, in what we have written here. There is no comment on the nature of p and p bar other than the following thing. p is of, uh, we are also assuming that we have a Bernoulli trials here. So for a Bernoulli trial, the probability of uh, success. In other words, for example, sorry, that the probability of seeing head for a coin toss. That's P. Now, in order to estimate P, what we do is the process we do is conduct M trials, count number of successes. And uh, p bar define p bar is number of successes divided by f. Okay, so that's what we have. The, the, uh, under this uh, setting, this expression holds true. Now let's do the mapping between what's written here. I hope you can understand my handwriting. And by the way, this is the reason why I don't want handwritten homework uh, because look at how bad it is. Um, so. I'll try to walk you through this. Um, the trials that we are conducting is every training example comes in. We are sitting on a particular classifier. The classifier is fixed, little, little h. A training example comes in, and I can uh, I make a prediction, and the prediction can be either right or wrong. Like heads and tails, you have right and wrong. The prediction being right is tails. The prediction being wrong is heads. So p for the setting that we want to apply is probability of 
classifier making mistake. And P bar is the number of trials. Each trial that we conduct is on the training set. We have M training examples, so we conduct M trials. And because we conduct M trials, we have M successes. In this case, success means the classifier makes a mistake. So number of classifier mistakes divided by training size. So that's the uh, analogy here. Just like coin tosses can either give heads or tails, your classifier can either be right or wrong. We care about the probability of being wrong or let's say being wrong. Uh, just like we care about the probability of the coin giving heads. In order to compute the probability of being wrong, we're going to apply that classifier on M instances and, and measure whether it is right or wrong M times. And we count the fraction of times it's wrong. Just like we toss the coin M times and measure the fraction of times it got heads. In both cases, the Hefting's inequality directly applies. In this case, P is the probability of the classifier making a mistake. That's the generalization error. P bar is the number of classifier mistakes on the training data divided by the training set. So that's your empirical error on the training set. Does that answer your question? And that also takes us to the end of the lecture today. So let's pick up from here on Thursday. Don't forget your uh, project submission. I'll see you on Thursday.